It was March 2011 when the United Nations authorized military intervention in Libya. The goal, as stated by the United States President Barack Obama, was to protect the lives of pro-democracy demonstrators from what was expected to be a bloody confrontation with the Libyan government. Two days after UN authorization, the United States and other NATO countries began bombing government forces. Seven months later, rebel troops with Western support took control of the country, killing longtime leader Muammar Gaddafi. In the years since, Libya has been described as a failed state, a country divided by rival governments and political factions, marred by economic chaos, civil war, and a growing threat from Islamic State. Later, we'll ask our panel about the prospects for peace and stability under the new unity government, but we begin in Tunis with CCTV's Yosef Gaiji. And Yosef, I mentioned this new United Nations-backed government. What can you tell us about it? Who's in charge and how's it being received in Libya? Yes, indeed, under the UN uh, supervision, um, the Libyan political agreement was signed in uh, December 2015 in Morocco. And uh, basically, this agreement uh, puts in place uh, uh, three new bodies, which are the Presidential Council, which is supposed to play uh, the function of the head of state, uh, then the Government of National Accord, which is uh, supposed to carry the function of the government, and then there is the State Council, which is an advisory body. The Libyan political agreement also um, keeps the House of Representatives, which is the Libyan uh, elected parliament, in place and recognizes its existence. And now, actually at this very moment, it is soliciting the approval and the vote of the House of Representatives to recognize the, uh, the Libyan uh, government of national accord. The government of national accord and the presidential co council are both led by uh, Faiz al-Sarraj, who moved to uh, Tripoli last month uh, with a uh, few other people, and he's based there to conduct operations and uh, lead the new Libyan government. Now, of course, before we had the formation of this unity government, there were competing factions in Libya, factions fighting for power. Are they now ready to come together? Indeed, uh, th this is the issue in Libya. It is the number of factions, the number of competing factions in the country. And uh, um, it is not clear whether they are uh, going to accept this uh, new government backed by the UN or not. But we know that uh, the House of Representatives, uh, which is based in the east of the country, in Tobruk, is divided. And there are people who are for the Libyan political agreement and for this uh, government of national accord and others who are not. In any case, this House of Representative, Representatives, it's been now uh, more than two months that uh, the Libyan political agreement came to light. And yet, they didn't vote yet. They didn't even meet, actually, to vote on this new government. On the other hand, we have the uh, General National uh, Congress, uh, which is based in Tripoli. And this Congress is uh, basically uh, almost uh, disappeared and dissolved and left room uh, for the new government. However, these two uh, bodies are also backed by several militias and factions who carry the weapons and who operate in different cities and control these different cities. And obviously, without the approval and uh, the acceptance of these militias and factions, the government will have major security issues. OK, thanks, Yosef. That's CCTV's Yosef Gaiji reporting from Tunis. Joining us to talk about all of this is Professor Alan Cooperman. He teaches global policy studies at the University of Texas at Austin. Najla El Mangush is a Libyan activist and the program officer for peace building and traditional law at the Center for World Religions, Diplomacy and Conflict Resolution. She joins us here in Washington, D.C. And with us from London is political analyst and commentator Sukant Chandan. Thanks to all of you for joining us. Sukant, let me start with you. So we have a new unity government in Libya. It's a deal brokered by the United Nations. Is this a turning point for the country? It's a continuation of the absolute horror story that the Libyan people have had to be subjected since the Arab Sting, the NATO and the Allied Death Squad uh, project to destroy and ruin Libya in 2011. The reason why the Western countries have forced this so-called unity government on the Libyan people, who already have several uh, juntas and administration in Libya uh, already, is to justify 
a whole number of things in, in well, an attempt to justify, I should say, a whole number of things in international law. One is to try and release the over $60 billion uh, that, are, uh, that are posited in the Libyan Investment Authority that they want to release and loot further from Libya. Secondly, to justify their military invasion uh, again, while well, there's military special forces have been there from the NATO forces throughout since February 2011 anyway. And thirdly, also, is to contain and manage and proliferate the death squads, including the so-called uh, Islamic State or Daesh in Sirte and other places around Libya as well. It's nothing but more bad, tragic news for the Libyan people. Nesla, what's your view on that? We know that this is a country that's been beset by divisions. There have been factions fighting for power, fighting for control. Is this government going to hold together, bring all these groups together? Well, I think there's hope from the Libyan people to have unity government because, uh, you know, have been struggling for more than five years now to, uh, you know, try to go from uh, transition from war to peace. However, the, the unit government have a lot of issues uh, and fragmentation uh, in terms of how to have legitimacy with the local people who are on the ground, who have been affected by violence in their daily life, who are not actually part of the negotiation process. So I think there is concern about the legitimacy of this government and what kind of challenges that already exist in the ground in terms of different militia groups and you know, the power of weapons uh, who are around the region in different uh, cities, including Benghazi and Sirt, and also now in Tripoli. Alan, you've written before, before this agreement was announced, that Libya is riddled with militants and anti-American terrorists, and that the U.S.-led attack, which was ostensibly to uh, save civilians, has backfired. Do you still believe that to be the case, given this new scenario? Yeah, I mean, that's certainly been the case uh, in, in the sense that uh, prior to NATO's intervention in 2011, uh, the war was basically ending. It would have been over in about a week. There would have been something on the order of a thousand people who had died tragically. Uh, but as a result of the intervention, we've now had five years of instability, and the death toll is well over 10,000. Uh, and so we can attribute that to this intervention, which backfired. As for this current unity government, uh, as your guests have spoken about it, it, it really does lack legitimacy. And I think what illustrates that perhaps most simply is the fact that this government couldn't even fly in to the capital uh, of Libya, the city of Tripoli. Instead, uh, and the reason they couldn't fly in is because local officials denied them entry to the airport. So instead, they had to come by sea. Uh, if you can't even fly into the uh, airport in the capital, uh, you really lack legitimacy. Sikhan, so, the attack on Libya, which was authorized by the United Nations, led to NATO, uh, which is a Western defense organization uh, created to protect the countries of Western Europe. It bombed the country. President Obama said it was to protect civilians. but was this about protecting civilians or was this about regime change in Libya? Well, similarly to Iraq, the uh, NATO and Allied death squad uh, invasion, bombing and destruction of Libya was based on a whole bunch of barefaced lies. Gaddafi did not bomb uh, peaceful protesters from the air. Uh, there were no so-called African mercenaries. It was nothing but a white supremacist racist justification for the mass lynching and persecution of dark-skinned Libyan and non-Libyan uh, dark-skinned African people i.e. the town of Tawarga. 30,000 people lived in the town of Tawarga in Libya, uh, a neighboring Maserata. Thir the only town in North Africa of uh, black Africans, 30,000 is no longer there because NATO's beloved uh, rebels and freedom fighters have ethnically cleansed that town completely. Uh, so it was an absolute classic imperialist regime change operation, but more so like Iraq, like Afghanistan, like Somalia, like they're attempting in Syria and other places. It's a divide and ruin project to totally destroy what was emerging and ascending in the global south, leading Africa, leading the global south, one of the, one of the biggest, best oil, uh, uh, producers of oil in Africa. This could not allow to continue in the minds of the imperialists and their sellouts.
our uh, allies within Libya, so it had to be destroyed, and that's what's happened. But now there's movement pushing back against this whole project. General Haftar, I'm not no big fan of, but General Haftar has liberated Benghazi from Daesh. He, he, he was expelled from Misrata, uh, uh, sorry, he was expelled from Sirt, and the Misrati militia handed over Sirt to Daesh there over there as well. And there's a whole bunch of disgusting things. Libya 2011 today is the greatest scandal of the 21st century, and it deserves justice. Alan? Um, well, I, I'm not sure that I would agree with um, all of the motivations that were identified by your uh, preceding speaker, but I, I would agree with, with the outcome. Um, there, there is a, a great deal of chaos there. In addition to this unity government, there are uh, two competing governments in the east uh, and west. And beyond that, there are hundreds, literally hundreds of separate militias that control little fiefdoms uh, in Libya. And uh, there was a report in the BBC just in the last day or so, and it said the unity government had the alliance or the loyalty of something like 10 of those militias. Uh, and so that's a, that's a tiny fraction of, of the forces that are, that are in uh, Libya. And until those militias can be unified to support uh, a, a true unity government, a true government of national accord, then instead what you're going to see is fighting between these militias, and then some of them are going opportunistically to ally themselves with ISIS. And that's one of the things that's helped ISIS get this foothold. Uh, and it's a fairly substantial foothold on the center of the northern coast uh, in Libya. And it's going to take uh, both political efforts and ultimately some military efforts to, to crush uh, ISIS uh, in Libya. And so, um, you know, as, you folks, as folks in England uh, say, uh, this is an own goal by uh, NATO, by Obama, by Cameron. Um, this was uh, not a failed state. This was not a uh, haven for uh, al-Qaeda or ISIS. And as a result of this really ill-conceived intervention, um, we've created uh, a, a third trouble spot uh, in the greater Middle East. Now, so what do you make of that? Those are pretty serious indictments we're hearing about Libya there. The fact that <coughs> this is not a unity government, just 10 factions of many, many factions have actually only unified, that the government lacks legitimacy, and the fact that they couldn't even arrive there by plane. They had to come by boat. How much control do they have? If you allow me, please, I would love to yeah, just sure. comment on their comments. Uh, the intervention for me as a Libyan, and I, I, I was there in Benghazi during the intervention, uh, it was necessary and was really uh, urgent need to save the civilians. There is many Libyan have the same opinion. But really, what's the problem with this intervention? There is no holistic strategies or vision from the foreign policy, from the international community, to help Libya to go through this chaos to peace or su sustainable peace. So I think that interventions was limited for short time, for specific need, and then the international community actually, you know, back up from the Libya. You know, I'm going to stop you right there because President Obama was recently asked what he considered to be his worst mistake as president. I want you to take a listen to what he said. Let's watch. Probably failing to plan for the day after uh, what I think was the right thing to do in, in uh, intervening in Libya. So the president there is saying it. Failed to plan for the day after. So what is the lesson you know, from this intervention in Libya? Well, the lesson, I think, you know, when you think about, uh, I think, first of all, I'm really, you know, against the military intervention as a solution. It could be limited, it could be uh, used in certain point, but there is actually, it should be structural and strategy that could support, support the locals from, you know, the bottom up. What the intervention tried to do, they tried to work with specific people and elite during that time to save the Libyan people, and that really worked, the purpose worked. But the problem after that, there is many early indicators where exist during that time as dangerous signs that Libya will go to, the, to what we have today. There is weapons everywhere. 
there is people who have been traumatized by this violence. They have civilians, they decide to fight Gaddafi where they have no experience witnessing the blood and witnessing the violence. You have economic crisis, you have a crisis with identity and political and, and social issues and grievances have been not addressed during all this dictatorship. So you have the potential to have this chaos. And I think as a, as a Libyan, I'm not finding here's excuse, but we don't have local expertise who can really read the situation well. And, and I think here, whereas the international community who have experience in Iraq and many different countries before, they should at least support or try to provide us with a plan that could lead the country, you know, uh, or uh, strategy or techniques that could go with the locals to reach the, the, the peace. And I think there is a dilemma between do we want political settlement or we want peace agreement? And there is a huge difference between the two. The negotiation process is not built in foundation that could support the peace. It's very short shortcut solution was very limited, uh, rushed. If you need to have real engagement, you need energy and time to invest in the locals and have the credibility that could support that peace mechanism. Okay, we've got to take a break, but before we go to a break, Shikhan, I just want to get your comments on what Najla has been saying. Huh? Well, God help any people who are inviting the ex quote unquote experience from Afghanistan and Iraq to their own country. It's, 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 it's crazy. I mean, Afghanistan and Iraq should tell you what's in store for your country if you invite the former colonialists of your country to come and try and quote unquote free you. They're not going to free you. It was always intended that they were going to do to Libya what they've done. And if you are wondering what they're going to do, well, look at Iraq and Afghanistan. And now we can see Syria and Yemen and other places. What's actually going on in Libya on the ground? I mean, by the way, Obama's comments are very stingy and measly and deceitful comments indeed. The only reason Obama is made those comments is to snipe at the British and French. Remember back in 2011, the British, French and the USA military top brass and political class were openly bickering with each other over Libya. United States was annoyed that Britain and France was dragging its military muscle to do Britain and France work in Libya. Why is that the case in 2011? And why is it the case today that Obama has made this comment about his greatest mistake about not destroying Libya in 2011, but not actually de developing monopoly of control for the United States post the NATO intervention. The reason is that Gaddafi, when he nationalized the oil, when he nationalized the oil from the British and US oil companies in the 1970s, he handed over the oil contracts and deals to the, particularly to the Italians and the French and other Europeans. And now this is the inter-imperialist rivalry and pro by proxy conflict that is going on in Libya between the British right. and the Americans on the one hand, or, or, or the US on the one hand, and the French and the Italians and others, the British and the UK, all the European and the North American powers are bickering amongst each other who's going to monopolize Libya, and the Libyan people are the victims of that.